I am Sheikh Ibrahim and I'm joined by Abu Munir Ismail Davids who is a Hajj guide. We sit down, we speak about the experience of the Hajjaj in 2023, we spoke about the booking, we spoke about the prices, we spoke about what's going to happen in 2024. Join me inshallah for this podcast. Hajj Zakhla Khan for joining me. So many people wanted this Hajj to fail and you're saying it's excellent. Why did people want it to fail? It's unfortunate but um, I didn't realize, like I work in the charity space and it's, it's, it's like a jungle, right? And I didn't realize that in the hut space, uh, having been a guide there so many years, I've never seen really the bad side, to so to speak, of the administration or the, the people behind it until this year. Uh, because the, the Saudis changed the way they did things. Last year, they did a thing that was a bit of a mess. This year, they kind of enhanced on that, which worked out to be a bit better. But everybody from the travel agents, the people who's been involved in the Hajj, wanted it to go back to the original system. Even myself, it would have been great to go back to the original system. I remember when last we spoke, we said, you know, that'll be better for all the Hujaj. So they felt that this year, if nobody did anything with the Saudis, then they were forced to go back to the old system. So when the brothers who got involved with this and we kind of went with them, they felt like we kind of, we're breaking the system, so to speak. Like if, if we don't get in, they'll, they'll be forced to go back to the old system. But if we went in and it, it works, then the Saudis have no reason to go back to the old system. So basically that is why I believe the people wanted it not to work because they want to go back to the old system. And you've experienced both the old system and the new system. What's better for the Hujjaj? So from a, from a, for the Hujjaj, it, the, the jury's still out in a sense of from a personal level, guidance level. From a financial level, it's hard to say because uh, each side had uh, costings, right? So it seems to be a bit more expensive now with the new system, where it was meant to be cheaper. But then that could be because of just the general increase in stuff. It's, it's sort of a collision of, of prices just going through the ceiling versus if the prices were still the same, like 2019, it would be hard to measure. An example, 2019-20, when we were going, we had a package of 20,000, which is a four-week package, five-star hotels. Uh, you know, you're basically there for four weeks. You've got the Oberoi, all of those sorts of things. And that was going to cost about 20, 21, 22,000. And that was like, wow, that's expensive. This year, the cheapest package was about 19, 20,000 anyway. And that's for two weeks. <laughs> that's for 12 days, right? But half the time, not the same type of hotels. So basically the costing, it's hard to measure whether uh, it would have been the same if we had to do it in the old system because of the price increases of stock, whether it would have been that high, still 25, 30. So from a pricing point of view, it's hard to determine whether it would have been cheaper now if it was in the old system. Let's speak about the Hujjaj and their experience in 2023 with the Hajj. Um, you're in Mecca and uh, you're now guiding 670 odd people to perform Hajj. How are the Hujjaj feeling, knowing that now they've got a Hajj guide with them, who's also from Australia and understands their mentality and can speak their language mm -hmm. very easily? Did they find it easy? Did they find any hardships? What was it like for the Hujjaj? So we had 871 Hujjaj. They, they gave us uh, an extra 200. We had 100 from New Zealand and another 23 from Fiji as well. So in total, we had over 800 Hujjaj that we were basically kind of responsible for, alhamdulillah. It was, a, it was a massive undertaking, and it was only through Allah's mercy that we were able to pull this off, right? Now, the Hujjaj, for those who understand how things work, uh, and from the survey that we got back, uh, 80 to 90% of the Hujjaj appreciated and understood this was value for us to be there with them because they could, they could understand and could see what's happening. There is a small percentage of people that, you know, like gave us feedback, wrote back, said, look, you guys look like you didn't know what you were doing. You had no idea about this. You had no idea about that and stuff. So there were times when we didn't know what we were doing, which is normal during Hajj. Uh, but then people who hasn't been there before can't appreciate that nobody knows what they're doing at that point in time. An example, buses leaving from Arafah, you know, that's the, the lot, like you draw where you are in the, in the, in the, in the order of the buses leaving. So what the Hujaj see, they see, just see people leaving, buses going, but we're not going anywhere and we're just all relaxing. So why aren't you guys jumping up and getting excited and getting the guys? So by the time we got to Mizdalifa, it was full, it was late. 
but they didn't understand that we were the second last in the in the lottery to leave from Arafah because we were the first to actually leave from from Mina. But overall, uh, nine, about eighty to ninety percent of the Hajjaj really understood and appreciated what we did because that's the feedback we've got. There is still like once again. The, the thing that really, really disappoints me about the Muslims in Australia or the UK, America, the matter, the people are so stuck on, 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 on the Madaib issue that they don't actually understand that when it comes to Hajj, there's only one way to do this. It doesn't matter which Madaib you follow. There's one way to do this. And then they go, oh, you guys don't cater for this particular Madaib. You guys don't cater for this Madaib. One brother came to me and he said, because we were talking about staying the three days in Mina. So I didn't realize that this is such a huge issue for people, right? Um, and the brother came to me the, the one day, he said, which uh, Aqeedah do you guys follow? I said, I said what, what do you mean, brother? He says, what Aqeedah do you follow? I said, explain to me why you're asking me that question. He said, why do you insist we stay for three days in Mina? I said, brother, it's not an Aqeedah issue. He said, but my sheikh told me I can stay for two days. I said, nobody said you can't. <laughs> we didn't say you can't. We're just explaining to you, encouraging to you, why three days, why do we do three days, why you prefer the three days. I said to him, okay, rather than asking me what Akira do I follow, ask me what's the reasoning and the fiqh around this. Uh, he was getting cranky. I said, okay, how about this? You ask your sheikh that told you about the two days, I want you to ask him one question. Ask him one question. He said, what's that? He's like, really cranky, what's that? I said, ask him, what did the Prophet do? So ask him, what did he do in Hajj? Did he stay till the 13th or did he leave on the 12th? And then you can answer yourself. I haven't seen him since then, but there was quite a lot of this. This was probably the most divisive <laughs> issue in Hajj for this year, which is which is crazy. I would have thought this would have been like a common issue before. It was. Well, but why was it a bit more highlighted with your experience? Because like generally in the past, like if we take people as our world or UMA or whatever, Basically, it's your people going with you, your people, people that is with you all the time. They know you. They know what aqidah you follow, as the guy said, you know, or what method you're going to follow. UMA says, okay, we stay two days. I will stay two days. The other groups, they normally stay three days. So nobody really argues about this. So this year, there wasn't uh, our people, so to speak. It was just anybody. So there was a variety of people and opinions that was within this 800 people. So it wasn't people that's generally okay, take the advice from the sheikh that's there. They have their own view, but their sheikh wasn't there. So they want to follow their view. And that's why it became like that. And the other thing is people are just lazy. People are just lazy. Do you know Hajj? They're just lazy. They just want to cut corners. I cannot believe in all my years I do this, and I talk about it in my classes. Guys, you're paying 20K, 25K for six days. And then... You get there and you want to cut corners in the six days. You want to find reason not to do this. What about this? What about that? Well, guys, you pay to do this. It's like going on a vacation to Canada or something. And you pay for a six-day cruise. And you want to jump off on the fourth day to go somewhere else. But you paid for six days. So I don't understand. It's just one of those things when we say to people. And before that, we said, well, look, when it comes to the six days of Hajj, we take no prisoners. We will tell you what we want you to do. It's up to you. You'll get cranky with us, and they did. I said, you'll get upset with me. But I can guarantee you, when you get on your plane to go home, when you sit in that seat, and you're flying to Australia now, you'll be so pleased with yourself that you have done everything as close to the sunnah as possible. You didn't cut any corners. I said, okay, you go on the 12th, you leave after Dur, you go off to Makkah to the Swiss hotel. The next day when we arrived there, tell me what did you do? What did you do in this last 12 hours? Buffet the Swiss? Breakfast at the Swiss? Did you actually, actually go down to the Haram? Or did you pray in the Masala in the, in the year? Did you actually go inside the Masjid? Did you actually benefit from being in Makkah? No. Most of them lazy out of the hotel. So this was such a divisive issue. It was crazy. But uh, Alhamdulillah, out of the 800 people that we had, over, four, over 50% stayed for the three days. One brother even threatened that he was going to write to the Ministry of Hajj complaining about us insisting they stay the third day. But we said, we're not insisting, we're just telling you what we do, what's preferable. And there's, there was a beautiful um, talk that uh, 
one of the Saudi sheikhs gave during Hajj for us. And it's the first time I actually heard this analogy of, of the, the, the Hajj days. And he explained it, he said, look, why is Arafah outside the Haram boundary, right? So he says, Arafah is outside the boundary. He said, this is how it is. The king, the king of all kings, Allah has invited you to a, a party. Allah has invited you to his house as the Hajj. So Allah has invited you. So when you go and visit somebody, like you go to like a king as an example, you don't just turn up at the door, knock, and they let you in, right? They'll, they'll make you either wait in the courtyard or they'll make you wait at the door and then they let you into some part and then you go to another piece and then somebody will meet. So he said, Arafah is the gate. So Allah's invited you to his house. So Allah takes you to Arafah is the gate. So at this gate, you need to seek for Allah permission to come in. So in Arafah, this is where you make tawbah, you ask Allah for forgiveness, all of that. Now Allah gives you permission to come in. So when Allah allows you to come in through the gate, when you come in, you first come in the courtyard. You know, not straight into the house. And the courtyard is Muzdalifah. So now you're the night in Muzdalifah. So you have to wait now with patience in the courtyard, so the garden. Then the next day, when we go to Makkah to perform tawaf, Allah allows you now into the house. Now you're actually in the house now. Allah lets you in. Then the next three days is days of celebration. Drinking and feasting. So it's like attending the party now. So he, uh, he also compares it to when you have a guest. You, you're allowed to you know, take care of a guest for three days. Right? After the third day, you can say, when you're going to go home, type of thing. So he says, Allah says, come for three days and celebrate and feast. So this is how he, the analogy he gives, right? And he said, imagine you have a very close family friend, your brother or your sister. They have a, uh, an event. And they tell you the event's going to last until 8 p.m. Right? And you, they, you, we need you to be here. It's very important to you for the family. But you say, look, I'm going to go home at 6 p.m. For no apparent reason, you just want to go home. Look, there's nothing wrong in you going home. They won't mind you going home. But you know the event lasts till 8 p.m. But you're going home early for whatever reason. You, you, have, you can, it's your right. So Allah says, for those who want to live after two days, there's nothing wrong in them living after two days. So that's the analogy he gave. Beautiful analogy. So you're like, we just said, <laughs> why would you even... Leave, right? So Alhamdulillah, it was beautiful. You're saying 50% of people stayed back. Yeah, You're saying 80 to 90% of people actually enjoyed the Hajj with, you know, with the feedback that you got and they really appreciated the fact that the guides were there with them step by step. Talk to me more about the logistics. Did, did, um, did the Hujjaj uh, you know, experience any difficulties when it came to logistics or is it just part and parcel of performing Hajj? Or is it that they, Alhamdulillah, this year was smooth? In comparison to previous years, they have nothing to complain about. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So they may have seen like the bit of a craziness here, we're chasing after a bus here, or we're walking there. But in comparison to them not knowing what can transpire and what happens is basically, because there was only 1.8 million people, by the way, on Hajj. Even though everybody says like it's the biggest year, no, no, there was only, there was under 2 million people. That in itself allows Hajj to be easier from a logistics, buses point of view. That means there's no traffic jam, so to speak. The buses are, are, are delayed a little bit, but not a great deal. So basically to go from Mina to Arafah was quick. From Arafah to Mazdalifah, once again, depending on where you were. So we had in front of us 4,000 Hujaj leaving from Arafah to Mazdalifah. So that's, if you f f divide 50 into that, that's how many buses needs to go before it's our turn, right? So it's just our turn was later, which means we left Arafah around about 10, 30, 11 p.m. We got to Mizdalifa within 10, 15 minutes. It was already full. Uh, so we had to like, you know, walk through the people sleeping to find a spot. Um, we did find a spot in the end. In the morning, like normal, we were judging whether the buses were moving to Mina or not, or whether the buses, or whether we would walk. So we knew where we were. So we said, okay, those who want to walk, it's gonna be 30 minutes, let's walk. But he said it's an hour, but we will already know it's about 30 minutes an hour. So a lot of people decided to walk with us, and others decided, look, they'll catch the bus. They'll wait for the bus. So by the time we got to back to Mina, an hour later, the girls who went for the bus were still waiting for the bus. So they decided to walk then. So that looks like uh, an issue where, why did you make us wait for the bus? Or why didn't you know the bus was going to take two hours or an hour to come? Those are things that's completely outside of your control. You see the bus is moving. 
you judge, okay, like it could be okay. But when you get there, it just turns out the bus got stuck or whatever. So then people look at like, okay, these guys don't know what they're doing. Even when at Arafah, when the buses was coming and the people were moving, they were saying, why aren't we going? They said, well, it's not our turn. We can't go. You have to go in order of what's allowed by the gate. So if we turn up in front of the gate, they'll just send us back to the, to the tent. So those were the only things that was bus problem. Other than that, there was no bus issues. No How bus was issues. Mina? Some in Mina? Mina was next level, absolutely next level. You know, for me, <laughs> it was like the f one of the first years I could say people didn't want to leave Mina. Imagine that, imagine that. Because the services they provided in Mina, look, it wasn't like fantastic compared to previous years, but just the small things we always talked about. An example, the toilets has always been an issue in Mina. But look, there's never going to be enough toilets in Mina, never. Right, so from a number of toilets, they're never going to fix this. They have to build hundreds and hundreds of toilets. But what they did was they re renovated all the toilets in the camp we were in anyway. The toilets were all revamped, all Western toilets, new showers, new wudu areas. And the best thing of all, they had cleaners cleaning the toilets 24-7. 24-7. As soon as you came out of the bathroom, somebody went in and cleaned it. Imagine that. It was, it, was, it was just amazing to watch these guys, and they didn't slack off. They were there all the time, right? It was just fascinating to see that little thing making such a big difference for the toilets. And the people queued up, they didn't mind waiting because it was clean toilets. They didn't have to jump from one toilet to the other, uh, 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 and that worked really well. And in the wudu area, the way we make wudu, it was funny because they have this, uh, uh, like, you know, like a normal basin, and there was like this button there. And everyone was wondering, what's this button? And you press this button, and the water comes out from underneath to wash your feet. <laughs> so I took a video of that. That was like, I mean, imagine in Mina, there's a button for water to come out of the bottom to wash your feet with. So something so simple and, and unique, which was interesting. Uh, other than that, the tents was all closed and air-conditioned. They had air-conditioned mechanics uh, all there all the time, which meant if anything broke, you know, they could fix it. Fortunately, in the tent we were in, nothing, everything was fine. It was just about, can you put it higher? Can you put it lower? Can you put it higher? Can you put it lower scenarios? And then in the actual corridors of things, you know, in the past they would have like a, a table with some tea or coffee. By day two, there's nobody manning it, whatever. The water's not working. This time, man, there was drink vending machines or like um, fridges with cold drinks 24-7 on every second corner. And it was always full, always full. Juices, Pepsi, you could drink as much as you want. Ice cream machines, full of ice cream all the time, until day three. Now, you might go, this is, what, what's it about to do at Hajj? We're just talking relative to what we had in the previous years, compared to the services that al Bayt or the group that we went with, provided to the Hajjaj and Mina. Mina was just comfortable, comfort to the next level compared to previous years. So let's speak a bit more about um, the future, 2024. Um, you know, people are considering now, they want to go to Hajj. Uh, they were expecting another mutawi fail in 2023. That didn't happen. Nusuk came out to, you know, showed up and it delivered. And the organization that you went with, which was Al Bayt, Al -Bayt. also delivered. Um, and uh, whilst there are some hiccups here and there, What's it going to look like in 2024? So first, the first thing I want to speak about is quota. Um, we've got a quota for one for every thousand here in Australia. I know that the previous Hajj, um, they took the wrong census, census data, which means that we're also going to get more. But I always say here that there is a possibility that we can likely get more than what the quota actually is for our country. What's, what's, what's it like? So the word is basically that at least if we get the quota, it'll be 800 something, which means it's to the, towards the census, the correct census, right? So that at least, that is something you can argue with them about. And they already listened to that and they probably implement that. So generally, I think the way things are working, so we don't know what they're going to do, but let's, uh, let's just say we, we, for a moment, we think about the way they would think. So they would initially just say, look, everybody will have their quota so that there's no drama from anybody else to say, why are you giving these guys more, whatever. So just from a, administrative political sense, everyone will have their quota. 
Now, this year, many of the countries couldn't fulfill their quotas. We're talking about like Turkey, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all these big countries, Indonesia, they didn't fulfill their quotas because it's becoming ex as expensive for those people as it is for us, right? So it's expensive not only for us, but for generally speaking from, from those countries. So people say, oh, it's cheaper to go through Lebanon. Yeah, it's cheaper for you. But for the people in Lebanon, it's relatively still almost the same price, so to speak. And obviously, Lebanon is around the corner. The people don't understand the airfare this year, the last airfare we paid for on Malaysian Airlines, we paid a, a normal ticket, was over $7,000 just for the ticket. So if we can get in early enough to get the seats and all that sorted, then obviously prices should come down a little bit. So my guess is that what they will do is, because the way the system works in Saudi is that they've allocated 12 companies, the Ministry of Hajj has given 12 companies in Saudi the right to provide services to the Hujaj of Australia. So there's Al Bayt, Al Raji, MCDC, I don't know all of the others, but there's 12 companies. This year, because of the short turnaround, things were going all over there, they basically gave the 600 to Al Bayt because they were the, the most advanced in dealing with Australia. They were already, already down the path, there was things happening, so, okay guys, just to make it easy, you guys deal with Australia exclusively. My guess is they'll pull that back and they'll say to all 12 companies, go, go and provide services to people in Australia. Then what will happen is people in Australia or companies, organizations, travel agents, they need to sign up an agreement with one of these 12 companies. Prepare a package, prepare the whole thing and say, okay, this is our package we're going to provide. And they'll have all of these services. So let's say six out of the 12 decides to provide a service to Australia. They then have signed up with six different organizations in Australia. That means they'll have to compete for that 800 uh, spots. So whoever's got the cheapest or whatever, whoever's, I don't know how they'll do it. So it won't be a monopoly, so to speak. So, It'll be so the people use the word monopoly, it's, it's an unfair word to use, simply because a monopoly means somebody intentionally went and did that and they wanted to monopolize it. It was by sheer coincidence that it unfolded this way. And um, for those who say these guys are monopoly, okay, why didn't you go? <laughs> Like anybody who's arguing, like the travel agents who, who used to make a lot of money from the Hujaj, because this year there was no money involved, there was no money to be made, nobody went, nobody signed up, because there's no money involved now, because all the money goes through, through Nusuk, which is the Saudi platform. You as a person involved in this, you make no money from it. So which means it required only people, it was only going to be people that, like a masjid, somebody is doing this just for, for because they like, enjoy doing the Hajj, that's what happened. And they basically, uh, uh, Sunnah Foundation only had 200 visas. They only sat, went to sign up for 200, two, four buses. And then because Al Bayt said, look, we've got all 671 now. Would you like to do this? I said, well, we don't know. We'll try. All the flights was arranged through us, which, um, which is something we shouldn't be doing. Al Bayt should be doing that. But because we became sort of part of Al Bayt, and we said, okay, let's do this. Let's get these 671 Hujaj from Australia. Let's, let's help them to go. And that's basically what we did. And then when we did that, the Ministry of Hajj said, okay, we'll give another 500. So we were going to have over 1,000. But show us your plan. So when we were trying to get another 500 seats, we were unable to do that. We only got another 200. So that's why we got another 200 visas. If we had to get 500 more seats, we would have had 500 more people go. So what's very closely attached to this whole quota issue is the process for booking. Yes. And uh, it wasn't as smooth as one would have wanted it to be um, from the reports that we've received. Um, so what's in plan for 2024 and how can we guarantee and, you know? Look, it was only not smooth simply because of the number. So if there was 4,000 visas, you wouldn't have had a problem. That means it would have been, it's like buying, a, uh, uh, like let's say the, the World Cup now, right? There's only 50 tickets left and 5,000 people are trying to buy the 50 tickets. For those who are going to miss out, it's going to be smooth. But for those who got in, it was smooth. And for those who sat there a whole night playing with it, trying to get in, it's not a nice thing to do, right? So that's basically what happened is supply and demand. So there was like over 4,000 people who were interested to go. There was only 600 uh, available spots. It was first in best dressed. And unfortunately, 
for some of the older people who are quite slow. So some people will get in, they book a seat, and they will go da 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 da. By the time they type in their credit card, whatever, it's gone. So what the system should do, and we've we're giving them this recommendation, that you know they should at, at least allow, once you've booked this thing, allow you to lock it until you know your payment process is done, all of that. Not like when you fail on the payment thing, it just chucks you out and you've lost it. So that's what happened. So there's obviously a flaw in the system in the way it's designed. Um, and also if you choose the wrong payment system, credit card, you don't have enough money, um, all of these sorts of things, we gave them, given them feedback about how the payment gateway should be improved, how it could be better, better done, all of that. And then the other part was, the idea was that as a guide, I should be able to send an invitation to those who want to go with me, as an example. So the system is designed to do that, but it didn't work. So an example, when I say I had 48 people that was part of my group and they wanted to go with me, I would have their names and their emails, and I would send them an invitation to my package to book it. Once I send them the invitation, they were meant to have, I think it was half an hour to buy it. And then after that, it opens up. So if you don't get in within that time frame of the invite, somebody else can buy it. But what happened to the system was it just opened up and it just was just, just free for all. And people didn't get invitations, some did, it was just, I don't know what went wrong there. So obviously they're looking at that, we gave them that feedback. Um, so Haj, it is my understanding um, that, and I could be wrong on this, you correct me if I'm wrong, um, that uh, it's not the intention for the Hajj group that went in 2023 to also do the same thing again in 2024, given that it was such a large group, right? Um, are you expecting other groups to do the exact same thing that you did 100%, with Al-Bayt? 100%. So what, and we want people to do that. We, it's, it's not easy to take care of 800 people. It's not something we want to do. But if we end up wanting, need, needing to do that again, then halas, we will have to do it because our goal is just to help the Hajjaj to go. And it's only through Allah's mercy that we managed to pull this off. There was about 20 of us, 20 guides. And in the end, we needed to get people that's been on Hajj at least three or four times that knew exactly what to do and that would work with us. Like if we say move right, you need to move right. If you say move left, you need to move left. Uh, we didn't need anybody to argue with us about, you know, this is my opinion. This is what my sheikh said. No, no, we didn't have time for that. So it was basically us trying to do what we know. We've been doing this for the last 30 years. This is what we want to do. Now, this year, Coming 2024, it's free for anybody to go. Sign up with al -Bayt, sign up with whoever to say, okay, we're an organization and we'd like to take the Hujaj. You've got Al-Raji and they'll sign up with you. They'll make a deal similar to that. So out of the 800, let's say 20 groups sign up, it's going to come down to which packages are available, the price of those packages and who's going. So people will again have the opportunity to choose. Let's say UMA wants to do a package and they want to take 50 100 people and everybody wants to go with you, then if the system works accordingly, which means you say, okay, you sign up with al -Bayt or Raji, and they're giving you two buses, two guides, they tell you this is your package, how much it cost. You have your 100 people, you send them the invite, they get the invite, they book it, and halas, then it's back to sort of a hybrid of the old and the new system. So that's how it's designed. This year it didn't work 100% to, to, to the way it's meant to, to work. If the system works like that, then you're back to the old and the two systems combined. You can go with the group you want to go with, you can go with the sheikh you want to go with, um, and they just sign up with uh, the old baits of the world. The only thing is that group that you're going with, in the past, they would make some money from it, whether it's for the mosque, whether it's their business. In the new system, they don't make any money. Mm -hmm. They're basically just helping the judge to go. And, and with this new kind of system, right, it also eliminate um, the issue that you saw this year, which was very prevalent in regards to um, madhabs. Yeah. And, and so, so what that would do is, and who does want to go with another sheikh, yep. well, you can. Yep. You just need to get them to yep. sign up with Al Bayt or any other organization. Yep. And we actually encourage people to do that. We, we are not interested in, in taking 800 people. We are, it's, 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 it's an amana, and it's a huge amana. So for the people who want to go, and, and one of the things when we chose the, the guides, stuff like this, in the end we knew we will have this problem, but then we thought, okay, if we have a guide that is a, like, in, in a way, they're not agreeing what we do. Like let's say we join our prayers in Arafah, Dua al-Nasr, 
And the Sheikh, one of our guides, says, no, I'm not joining because I don't believe I need to join. And his whole 40 people that he has with him is of, 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 of here. So we tried to avoid that. We said we don't need that in, 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 in the Hajj itself. So that's how it ended up looking like it's basically a Sunnah doing this. But it was just by default and coincidence. And for us, at the end of the day, we were responsible for all of this. So you were, it made sense logistically to make that decision. 100%. Um, as opposed to kind of trying to cater for everyone, which made Look, it a lot we more. We spent two weeks trying to cater. We spent two weeks. And Brother Shan and I were going back and forth. And we had all of these names, all of these things. I spoke to Sheikh Shadi. I said, give me the names. Give me the people that you think you know, will fit into this category. Give me the name of this Sheikh that will fit into this category. Give me the name. We did all of that. We tried to be politically correct, so to speak. We tried to make sure people cannot accuse us of, of what they're accusing us of now. Then we got to a point where we found out that some Sheikhs weren't even talking to us. They wouldn't even res respond to us. They, they signed up and then changed their mind. We felt there was something happening on the outskirts. So we left it at that. And then... We had to make a call. We had to make a decision that are we going to try and make this uh, politically correct and appease everybody, or are we going to make sure this works based on our experience? So then they said, Halas, bite the bullet. Let us go with who we know, what we know, and we know we can work with these guys. We know we can do. So logistically, we then said, okay, we now the people we're taking are actually logistics workers, so to speak. We are, already had enough sheikhs with us. Sheikh Abdul Salam, Sheikh Abu Bakr, um, Sheikh um, um, Yasir, um, Sheikh Muhammad Khan, all of these guys were already going. So we had enough shuyukh with us, alhamdulillah. Now we needed the guys who are going to do the work. Abu Munir, Zakhla Khairan. If you know anyone who's going to benefit from this content or they're going to perform Hajj in 2024, they have intentions to perform Hajj in 2024, please share this video with them. Give it a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to our channel so you can see more and more content. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.